Hey everybody, it is Mackenzie, otherwise known as Mark DeLoff. Um, I'm on here because I have nothing better to do. It is a weekend. I had to go home sick from work yesterday and I am tired and want something to do. So I'm going to try a drunk history of the Marquis de Lafayette. So now I'm going to go attempt to grab something, get this party started. I'll be back. Cozy like velvet. It's a lover, not a fighter. Russian standard. It's a good way to win elections. Oh, get tipsy. Excuse me. And you can't forget French wine because French wine is just required, I think, if you're going to, to start talking about Lafayette. Okay. I don't even know what I look like now. Hello! <laughs> I'm going to... Oh, I... You know me as Marc Deloff. And we are going to talk about some Lafayette. I hope you enjoy. If you don't enjoy, I'm still going to enjoy. So I don't even care. Marie-Joseph-Paul-Yves Rochaubert de Montier, Marquis de Lafayette. Boom. Was born, and I probably <laughs> just screwed that up. Was born September 6th, 1757. It could be nobles of different things, but they were nobles of the sword, which meant you were basically born to get yourself killed. So, Lafayette's uh, uncle did it. Dead. Lafayette's father was killed when he was two years old, so he was raised on the stories of all of his dead ancestors from way back in the day, including his father, who he really, you know, that was a big thing that was lacking in his life, was some kind of father figure. He was, uh, 40. <laughs> and then he, when he was 12, his mother passed away of a sudden fever, which left him a complete orphan in the middle of Paris. And he was noble, and he was well-connected, but he was very young, and there were only two people that attended his mother's funeral, him and a family friend. So he was left largely alone. Oh my goodness. I'm good. I'm feeling emotions. I'm not an emotional person, okay? This liquor is betraying me. I am not an emotional person. Anyway, poor little baby Lafayette is left in the middle of Paris alone. At 12 years old in school and is trying to figure out life as a 12 year old without his mom. Oh, that's so sad. Along the way, we're gonna skip some stuff. Along the way, eventually Lafayette and DeKalb kind of sit down together after Silas Dean, the American ambassador to France, is like, oh, both of you are gonna get major general's positions as soon as you go to America. It's gonna be dope. They both agree that Lafayette, to avoid further confusion and frustration in France, should buy his own ship and sneak out of France. So they get together and what do they do? They hop in a boat. Lafayette buys La Victoire with the victory. He hops on there. Um, <laughs> and by now, this is, by the way, his second attempt to do so. Hops on there. Um, some say he was dressed in a merchant's cloak. Some say he was dressed as a woman. But either way, he snuck out of France. <laughs> I'm gonna say that he snuck out in a corset. If, I guarantee you it didn't happen, but it just makes my life <laughs> that he would try. Um, and it matches the rest of his character regardless. So he snuck out of France in possibly a corset and dress um, onto this boat, and he and DeKalb sail across the ocean to America. Abandoned wigs, they abandoned shoes, and by the end of it, they were like half naked walking in Philadelphia, like, we made it! Hey! Finger guns. Go to Congress, and Congress is like, Thanks for your effort. Get out. We have had so many French volunteers. You guys just want in on the glory. You don't care about the American cause. Take your stuff. Take your issues. Go back to France. We don't care. Thank you so much for your effort. Washington has had nothing but crap from the French this entire time. Every time a French general, officer, whatever shows up, they cause all kinds of chaos in camp. They are completely disrespectful of American ideology. They do not give any craps about anything whatsoever. And they're basically, like, at one point, one French officer drowned and everybody was relieved. 
So he gets word he's going to get another French officer and that he's 19 and that he's a major general. And George Washington is like, what the hell, guys? What am I supposed to do with this kid? And Lafayette shows up and is like, I am here to learn, not to teach, not to preach. I want you to teach me. I am willing to learn. I want to be as useful as you see me. And it goes into this list. And Washington is like, oh my gosh. This is not exactly what I expected. But he's Washington, so he's not going to cave right off the bat. You know, he's got to, you know, mull over all this stuff. A couple days later, they attack the British at the Battle of Brandywine, right? September 11th, 1777. The Marquis de Lafayette goes into battle for the first time ever. Because even as a colonel in France, all he did was maneuver. He had never actually been in a combat situation until this day. So he goes, and he's waiting with Washington. He's watching the battle. He sees the lines falling apart. Lafayette goes to Washington and is like, Washington, I need to go out there because the lines are faltering. I feel like I can help the situation. I know I'm not in charge of anything yet, but like, come on, dude. So Lafayette goes and he rides out on his little pony. He leaps off his horse and he grabs the soldiers and he's like, get in line, get in line. But he doesn't speak English hardly at all at this point. So nobody can understand what he's saying. He's just grabbing random people by the shoulders, trying to get them, like literally throwing them back in line by the shoulders. The Americans are pissed off because they're like, what on earth are you doing, bro? Confused, all kinds of mayhem. Eventually, Lafayette kind of is like, man, like something's wrong here, right? And his aide yells across the way like, hey, your boot. And he looks down and his boot is filled with blood. He's been shot, right? So <laughs> he's feeling kind of woozy. His aide comes up, brings his horse, puts him on the horse. And together with the American forces, they successfully and safely retreat, thanks to Lafayette's little help there. They get to the edge of this little bridge. Washington and everybody catches up. He gets his wound bandaged and he's like, okay, I'm ready to go back in. But he's super woozy and everybody knows it. So Washington's like, thanks, but no thanks. Go back to these farmhouses, take a nap, feel better. He was apparently sitting on the dinner table when Washington and the rest of them came in. And he, he begged them not to eat him because they looked so famished when they came in, which I'm sure none of them were in the mood for, but he thought was hilarious. He gets sent off to the hospital. He recuperates for several months. Spends the entire time writing to France and being like, America is awesome. The cause is valid. We need to support them. We need to send troops. We need to send supplies. And over this period of time, starts becoming friends with Horatio Gates. And, um, oh gosh, why am I drawing a blank? He's an a-hole. Oh, Charles Lee and Thomas Conway. All of these people start noticing that Lafayette is super close to Washington. When Lafayette comes back from Valley Forge, Washington is, like, really pleased to have him. Washington gave him his personal surgeon during his recovery. And part of that was because he was French. But part of that's because Washington was starting to figure out this kid is not like the other French people. Like, he's something's up with him. He's, he's kind of great. So he comes back, literally one-footed, one-foot booted, the other foot with a shoe, and he's limping around camp, but he's, like, gonna do it because he's feb. Gates, Conway, and Lee are, are all kind of against Washington, and they figure that if they can get Lafayette on their side, they'll be good to go. He goes, he sits down for dinner, and they all start talking about how crap Washington is as a general and how he needs to be replaced, and make a ton of underhanded comments about Washington. And Lafayette is having none of it, but he had enough measured, like, sense of reason to just let it slide. He was gonna just let it slide. So, he lets it slide, for now, and lets them all finish, and then he rises with his glass and says a toast to General Washington, the leader of the Continental Army, and forces all of his enemies to toast him, which I think is fabulous and is like the epitome of Lafayette's personality. <laughs> because Lafayette started figuring out that Washington was the key to the revolution and Washington was amazing. He, he idolized Washington. He thought of him as a father figure. Washington thought of him, 
thought of, began, not at this point, but began thinking of him as a son. And so he couldn't imagine anyone going against him, but when these great noble individuals in his mind, like Gates and Conway, started arguing against Washington, he couldn't fathom it. So he forced all of them to toast the, to toast Washington, and <laughs> there are portraits and all sorts of stuff about it. <laughs> I think it's amazing. It's basically <laughs> it's basically being like an American, like an Arabic American that's infiltrating Saddam Hussein's like reign and regime, and being like. To George Bush. <laughs> it's the worst. It's amazing. He goes back to France. He's in great standing. He left sneaking out of France. He came back a freaking hero. Everybody was thrilled that Lafayette was back. And so he goes and he meets the king and the queen. And the king and queen are like, hey, Lafayette, you're back. And he's like, yeah, boy, you are back. Finally convinces the French government to send ships, to send troops, to send supplies. Um, they've officially become allies with America at this point, which he was super stoked about, Bru and, and gave him the opportunity to bring all of this back to America, right? Um, his, his son was born, and he was given the name George Washington de Lafayette. So you can tell where the relationship between Washington and Lafayette had really sparked. At any rate, eventually, um, he went back to America, he brought his guns, he brought his ships, just like the song says. Um, but not all of them, just enough to kind of placate everyone. And then he came back to Washington and said, I'm back, I'm so excited, I can't wait to tell you all these things, it's gonna be great. The French are coming, and Washington was beside himself, and <laughs> so the Battle of Yorktown rolls around, right? Everybody gets this wrong. Lynn manuel needs a spanking for what he did, but... Lafayette was in charge of Hamilton's brigade that goes over there and attacks Redoubt 10, right? The, the Redoubts 9 and 10 uh, needed to be taken, so the French decided to take Redoubt 9, and Redoubt 10 was supposed to be taken by Lafayette, Lawrence, Hamilton, and a couple other people. They go in and clean house, and they get it done, right? And um, eventually they obtain the surrender at Yorktown. Lafayette thinks that Cornwallis is an admirable man, is kind of surprised when Cornwallis doesn't show up, and then as the British are marching in, he notices that they're all looking at the French. They refuse to look at the Americans. So he calls the fifer, and he calls the drummer, and goes, hey, play Yankee Doodle. So they start playing Yankee Doodle, which is an insulting song towards the Americans, so it forces the British to look at the Americans while they're surrendering, and that's how we continue to sing Yankee Doo. But anyway, so that happens, and then um, <laughs> they surrender, and Lafayette pretty much goes back to France. The war continues, but he, he decides that he's going to go back to France. Something you must understand about Lafayette he and Washington had an endearing relationship. That father figure that he had never had arrived in the form of George Washington, the best possible father figure you could have. Washington, at one point, while Lafayette was in France, asked two French um, um, uh, officers that were dining with him about how Lafayette was doing, and they replied that he was doing well, and Washington became emotional and said basically that, that he is such a good boy, that there is uh, no one more noble than he, and that I am I'm thrilled for his success, and he became so emotional. And so, but things like that, for someone that is stoic as Washington was, just tells you kind of a brief example of how genuine their actual paternal and, um, relationship was. He spent the night under an oak tree with Washington, curled up in his giant cloak, and they talked about Lee, and they talked about life, and a bunch of different things. And ever since then, they were completely intertwined. They were, they're, they're, um... They were constant, they were a constant from that time forth. Washington would write him for encouragement, Lafayette was willing to send five pages of encouragement. So, that's that. Without Lafayette, the Americans would not have won the war. Many did not have enough for clothes, much less to de defend themselves, to plant their crops, to take care of their families, 
and Lafayette single-handedly provided several hundred thousand dollars worth of assistance personally. He cultivated relationships between France and the United States before and during and after the war. And when he passed away and was buried, he made sure to have American soil sprinkled over his grave so that he could still be buried in both worlds. I think that it's very important to remember Lafayette. He fought for us personally. He served American food at his table. The guy was the biggest American uh, fanboy that existed and has existed to this day. And if someone that has no idea about America is so convinced that America can succeed, what are we doing as her citizens? to help in that endeavor. I guess this is the point of the, the video where I plug in, get out there and vote, and actually be active in what you believe in. But I do believe that, because it took somebody sneaking out of France <laughs> in possibly a dress across the ocean to come and actually give us French aid. So without Lafayette, we would have been nowhere. And I will be always grateful to him for that. So, this has been Mark DeLoff's Drunk History. I appreciate the fact that you have watched this video, and I hope to hear from you soon. Have a good night, bonne nuit, adieu, mon ami, adieu.